Praise the Lord. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to know that you're watching this video. We are streaming from our Walnut campus and uh, it is a beautiful day. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah, I know there's so many bad news going on out there and many things we cannot explain. I cannot explain it. I don't have the full picture, but I know who does. And that's why in today's message, this is something that we all need to fall back on to. That is to trust Him. To, to know that He is a God that is in control. Even though when things are out of control, He is still in control. Let's turn to the slides here. Um, the title that I have for today's message is, Does Your Faith have a resting place. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I face challenges, I forgot that I have to rely on the Lord. That's where my faith rests on, upon the Word of God. But sometimes you want to see it for yourself. You don't have the full picture. That's where faith comes in. Faith, faith is the evidence of things not seen. And that's sometimes where you're at. And there's nothing else that you can do. But when you have faith, you got God, God is in control, you're in good hands. So the first passage that we want to look at is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11. In the New King James, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God wants to give us a future and a hope. And not only that, He has thoughts of peace. Even though in the midst of the challenges that we face, it seems like, oh God, how could this be a th thoughts of peace? It seems like I'm not out of the woods and I got this one problem and then another one coming and then I got five more coming. God, uh, don't you know what I'm facing? The Bible says in His Word that He wants to give you a future and a hope. And we'll see later on uh, some of the examples in the Bible that you can see what they went through. And in the end, we can see that God truly is in control. God truly want to give us a future and a hope. In the um, message translation of the same passage, Jeremiah 29 verse 11, it says, I know what I'm doing. This is a very, very interesting verse because this is the only time that I can remember that the Lord says, I know what I'm doing. It's, it seems like, why, God, why, why do you have to say that? Obviously, you know what you're doing. But the Lord wrote that down because why? Because this message was written to the people of Judah, people of Israel, when they were in exile. They were there for 70 years. And in the midst of those years, God says, I know what I'm doing. Obviously, if you're in exile, if I'm in exile in a foreign land, I would say, God, do you know what you're doing? And God says in His Word, I know what I'm doing. I have I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not to abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. Do you have a future that you hope for? If you do, God want to give it to you. Now the next passage that we want to look at is John chapter 10, verse 10, which I believe we are all familiar with. And, and, I, um, and I want to tell you that I purposefully pick verses that we're familiar with so that in this time of challenge, it's not like you got to memorize another verse. But I want to, I want to let this verse speak life to you. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 has spoken life to me over and over and over again. John chapter 10 verse 10 is the same thing. And in the New King James, it says, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come, Jesus said, Jesus have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. We know that the thief wants to steal, want to kill, and to destroy us. But Jesus have come to give us life and life more abundantly. And in the 
Passion Translation, which is another translation that is also my favorite, a thief has only one thing in mind. A thief has only one thing in mind, and that is he wants to steal, he wants to slaughter, and to destroy. But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. That's God's desire for you. He wants to give us life and life abundantly until to the point where you overflow. Isn't God good? He put this in his verse to encourage us, but at the same time also to warn us that the enemy is there to steal from us, to kill us, to destroy us. But Jesus has come to give us life and life abundantly. And if I were to say these things, you know, if Jeremiah 29 verse 11 and uh, John 10 verse 10, you might say, yes, Lord, I, 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 know, I know your word. You might ask this question, but why is this happening? Why is there COVID-19? It doesn't make sense. God, if you want to give us life, just deal with it. Take care of this problem. Heal all of us. You are our healer, right? You know, I have a bunch of questions. I was asking God, Lord, why do you allow certain things to happen in my life? And to me, it is unpleasant. I remembered when I preached um, four weeks ago, I was talking about the life of Ruth, talking about Naomi. And at that time, uh, Naomi's husband died, his children died, and he has to go, come back to Israel with his daughter-in-law. And his daughter-in-law was a Moabite. And I was thinking, God, how could you, how could that be a good plan? Am I right? If family members died, there's famine in the land, you have to move out of that place, and people don't like you because you are a Moabite, but the Word of God says He has a good plan for you. Now what we didn't know, or what we know later on was, as we study the Word of God, God really have a good plan in the life of Ruth, in the life of Naomi. If you want to know more about it, I want to challenge you to read the book of Ruth and be blessed. So going back to, why is this happening? It doesn't make sense, you might ask. How could it be good? How could this be good? You know, some of us were prophesied over. And the prophecies are spectacular, that you will be blessed. You will be, you know, receive all kinds of things. You know, we all like those good prophetic, prophetic words when it was spoken over us. But what you experience right now with the issues of today, with COVID-19, with the unemployment, you might be out of job. You might be out of a job. And I'm not looking down upon that, but what I'm trying to say is, believe the Word of God. Believe the prophetic word that has been spoken over you. Remember that the enemy want to steal, to kill, and to destroy you, but he has come to give you life. Don't surrender. Don't give up. You need to persevere. Stay in the battle. Many times without us realizing it, we gave up too soon. The prophetic word that has been spoken over me is like, oh God, I don't know how I can do it. And then when things happen, contrary to the word of God, I ask the Lord sometimes, why is this happening? Hey, I'm still human. I have feelings. There are things that I don't understand, but the question I, that I need to ask myself is, where does my faith rest in? And so, the Bible says that He has thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. And you wonder at times, Lord, are you sure you know what you're doing? And we read that passage I know what I'm doing. Where is God in the midst of the pandemic? How could this be good? You know, I read earlier, by Thursday, over 650,000 Americans have been infected by 
the coronavirus. Over 650,000, and that's a lot of people. And they're saying that about 2% of those, or maybe less, and I'm praying that it'll be less, that they would be dead. And I, I, I have no desire to wish them death. I pray that all of them will be healed in the name of Jesus. We believe in a healing God. But the reality is, there will be people that will die. So you would wonder, God, if you're in control, if you plan good things for us, how come you're allowing death? Jeremiah 29, 11 says, it was written when Judah was in exile in Babylon, as I said earlier. Gideon echoed the same thing in from the book of Judges chapter 6. And we'll go there right now. Judges chapter 6 in the New King James, it says, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And verse 13, it says, Gideon said to the angel that spoke to him, he said, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, and, and this is Gideon speaking to the angel. Why then has this happened to us? And he go on to say that, And where are his miracles which our fathers told us? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. At that time, the people of Israel had crossed into the promised land. Keep in mind, they are already in the promised land. However, they were being oppressed by the Midianites. So when the angel spoke to Gideon, <laughs> the Lord is with you. And Gideon feel like Gideon felt like, no, God is not with us. We are a defeated nation. We are in hiding. We are oppressed. We are the miracles that, that we were told. They don't experience those things. So it's the same question. Why is this happening? Why do you allow persecution to happen? The same like in this day and age. In times of tragedy, tragedy or at the current condition that we're facing today, we question God. And that's, that's our tendency. We question God without realizing that we don't know what we don't know. This, this to me is a revelation. You know, interestingly, I've never heard somebody said this. Maybe somebody had said it, but it never occurs in my mind. But we question God. Even worse is we face the temptation of making God our adversary instead of our advocate. When we question God because we don't believe what the Lord has said, we made Him, we tempted we are tempted to make God as our adversary instead of our advocate. We only know in part. That's the reality. His ways are higher than our ways, the Word of God says in Isaiah 55. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Isaiah 55 verse 9 says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The reality is, we may not understand everything. You may be smart, you may read you know, 100 books a month, read through all the news that is out there, all the periodicals, all the studies that have been done. You, you may have everything, all the knowledge in the world, but the reality is, we don't have the full view. We don't have the whole perspective that God has. The reality is, let me repeat it again, we don't know what we don't know. We do know that He has a good plan for you and me. That's written in the Word. It is confirmed by the Word of God. Can you accept that reality that He has a good plan for you and for me? He came to give us life and life abundantly. That's what the Word of God says. And that's where I rest my case. But if we cannot explain the current circumstance, it doesn't mean that God is at wrong. If we cannot explain it, that doesn't mean that God had made a mistake. Just because we cannot explain it, that doesn't mean that something is wrong. 
Does your faith have a resting place? The book of Job is, uh, I'm going to start closing. The book of Job is one of the most interesting book. As a matter of fact, going back years ago, this is one of the books that I hate reading. I don't like reading the book of Job because it is not very pleasant what Job went through and so forth. As a matter of fact, what his friends did to him when in, his friends, in fact, supposed to encourage him, his friends were judging him and so forth and so forth. So I'm going to go through this rather quickly, but so you get the whole picture. Uh, as I said, it's one of the hardest book uh, for me to read. It, uh, it was hard because the book of Job says, and this is in chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Job was blameless and upright. One who feared God and shunned evil. This man is blameless. This man is upright. He's a good man. He feared God and he shunned evil. And yet, and, and that, that's the clincher, and yet, he suffered multiple tragedies. And when I said multiple tragedies, it's not like a broken foot, or, you know, uh, his business went bankrupt, or broke his toenail, whatever it is. No, 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 no. This is major, major, major tragedies. And it's not like, oh, it happened in a span of... Uh, 20 years. No, no, no. It happened just like that. It happened overnight. Can you imagine having 10 of your children to perish the same day? That's what he has. 10 of his children and their adults, they all die the same day through weird circumstances. And it seems like only God could have done that. And not only did his family, his, his children died, all his belonging, all his possession, his fame, his fortune. He was a respected person in that society at that time. He lost everything. He lost his position in society. They looked down upon him. They spit upon him. When before that, he was an elevated person. So tragedies upon tragedies happened to him. As a matter of fact, a second wave of tragedy happened to him to the point where uh, he was having boils, painful boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Sitting down is painful. Standing up is painful. Lying down is painful. And it smells. So this was what Job went through in life. Let me repeat it again. He was a blameless person. He was an upright person who feared God and shunned evil. And you would wonder at times, wow, if that kind of a person have to go through quote unquote hell, how about you and me? Let me qualify that. You and I, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Savior, the Lord have washed your sins. You are a blameless person. You are upright. Job did not have Christ to wash his sins. You and I, when we receive Christ, your sins have been forgiven. It is remembered no more. The grace of God is at work in your life. Let me go on. Job's best friends. These are his best friends. They came to encourage him. So for one whole week, when they saw him, his deplorable condition, it was so bad that they did not say anything for seven long days. They didn't say a word because it was so bad. It's, it's just unreal. They, and, and the unfortunate thing is on the eighth day, you know, you know, sometimes my wife would say, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything. I can say the same thing with Job's 
three best friends, they don't have anything good to say. They should just keep their mouth shut. So when they start speaking on the eighth day, they start judging him. Job's circumstance made it appear, let me repeat it again, Job's circumstance made it appear that either he had sinned or God was unjust. Now, if the choice is whether Job had sin or hidden sin or God is unjust, what would his friends pick? They will not say God is unjust. No, they will not. The only explanation is Job must have sin. Now, going back to the title of the previous slide, it was, We Don't Know What We Don't Know. His three friends that are wise, best friends of his, they don't know what they're saying because they don't have the full picture. No other possible explanation. Even when there's no other possible explanation between Job and God, God cannot be unjust. God is just that it has to be Job that has sinned. But we must recognize that there may be a satanic source involved in suffering and affliction. This is the missing piece that Job's best friends did not have. So I'm going to start to close. Job was tried, I'm sorry, Job was tired, not because, I'm sorry, let me repeat it again. Retake. Can I do that? No. Okay. Job was tried not because of his unrighteousness, but in spite of his righteousness. Job was tried not because of his unrighteousness, but in spite of his righteousness. Job's trial was to establish his righteousness. Satan's goal was to prove Job to be a sinner. God's goal was to establish Job's faithfulness and integrity. Job said, after he went through all of this, at the beginning and until the end, it says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Though he slay me, he said, yet will I trust him. As a matter of fact, his wife told him, why don't you just curse God and die? I mean, it must be quite deplorable if your wife can come to you and said, why don't you just curse God and die? And it was a very, very dire situation. And many times we don't realize with what we are seeing that is happening in our midst. Um, we, we have seen, and I've said it earlier to you, that the um, COVID-19 in the U.S. alone, there's 650,000 that are infected. But what we don't realize is as I was studying this, um, God, God is truly in control and He does things that we don't understand at times. And as I said earlier, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, when the bubonic plague that happened in the 14th century, it killed Europe's up to half the population. Half of Europe's population were slaughtered, died because of bubonic plague. The Black Death, they call, is estimated to have killed anywhere between 30 to 60 percent of Europe's population. In total, the plague may have reduced the world's population for an estimated 300 to 375 million people in the 14th century. Now, I'm not saying we want more death. No, 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 I'm not saying that. But the same God that ruled in the 14th century also rule in the 21st century. The Spanish flu that happened in 1918, at that time the world has 1.8 billion people. 
it killed up to 50 million people worldwide. Wow, that's a lot. 50 million is a lot of dead bodies. But God has let this and other catastrophes to happen. Would we be wise enough to consider what God is intending and doing in the world today? Are we going to be wise enough to know everything? We don't. But God has allowed these things to happen. Yes, we do need the grace of God. Yes, He has died on the cross for you and me. He has a good plan. Can you believe that? Can you trust Him? Believe that God is for you. In, even in the midst of the intense trials. If God's will for us is good and God cares His cares for his children, we have to have the faith to believe and must come to terms even when we are facing challenges in our lives. Don't focus on de declaring our innocence and questioning the justice of God. And your faith and my faith must have a resting place. And I'll close with a testimony. As some of you might have heard, my dad passed away in the month of February. And death is never easy, but I know he has a good plan. You know, at that time, I, I don't know, I didn't see it with my own eyes if my dad has received Christ or not. And I wonder at times, God, why do you allow this to happen? Why don't you allow me to see my dad receive Christ before my very eyes? And that's where the word faith comes in. Does your faith has a resting place? The word of God says that when one member is safe, the whole household is safe. That's the word of God. And I hold on to the word of God. And when he died, I was at peace. I was at peace. And I wonder, how could I be at peace? And I was in Florida at that time. I flew back the same day. And I was at peace. And I said, God, I know I'm at peace, but I want two signs from you. <laughs> you know, it's okay to ask. The same questions that Gideon asked. Gideon asked for two signs when he was told by God to do what he was called to do. And I did the same thing. And you know something? God answered my request. Today, I want to challenge you, even in the midst of of the challenges that you're facing, can you find rest in Him? Can your faith, can your faith rest in the Lord your God? Today, I want to challenge you, and not just today, but every time you face challenges, every time you are discouraged, every time you feel like you're giving up, I want to encourage you, meditate upon the Word of God. Meditate upon Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Meditate upon John chapter 10, verse 10. Read it. Discuss it with your family members. Discuss it with your roommates. Talk to them. Hey, I don't know if I can make it through. Talk to your carousel leaders. Talk, talk to somebody that you can trust. Talk to somebody that can encourage you. This is a time for us not to keep it to ourselves, but this is a time for us to seek help when you need it. And as a matter of fact, if you want to receive Christ. Today, well, uh, after service, we have people that are waiting to hear you making the text message or the phone call on the line that is provided here. I want to encourage you to make that call because why? Your life matters to God. You're precious in His sight. Even though you face challenges, God is there for you. God is good and He planned good things for each and every one of us. Thank you for watching the video. Thank you for being on this live stream. God bless you.